The way in which we create, communicate, and consume content is changing faster than ever. So how do we successfully reach our intended audiences every time? And when it comes to creator content, is there a magic formula for maximum reach? We've gathered friends and experts from across our community to explore these questions and help us understand the relationship between creative content, impact, and reach. Let's get started, shall we? For me, reach means more than just numbers. Um, it's also about engagement, that kind of sense of excitement. You know, that's the goal is getting people to respond to you, to share stuff and to be creating their own sort of content based on what you're doing. And I guess it's often the case that interpretive content can then become part of a, a live engagement, if you like, part of a, a workshop or a school session or outreach programs. Indeed, using the, the catalyst of interpretation to invite people to come and be part of a co-creation or a co-curation of content with you it can be quite exciting and dynamic reach and access and inclusivity is super important for the Van Alva Museum. I think accessibility in itself is the, yeah, the basis of inclusivity. Without ac accessibility, you cannot be inclusive. We have a formula for impact, which is reach plus effect equals impact. So if you don't reach anybody, there's no way you can have an effect on them so you can't have impact. I think reach is, is often interpreted very literally in just sheer, sheer numbers rather than the kind of depth of that of that engagement. I would hope that, that over time as organisations become more digitally mature they will start to be able to um, relax about those, those reach numbers and focus much more on that kind of depth. They're the interactions that really change things, change people, change the world. You really have to think about your intended audience, you really have to think about what their interests are I mean, this, you can't hit everybody. That's always like, a, you know, it's a, an impossible task. So I think it's always good to, to, to focus in on, uh, on who you really want to be communicating with, you know, who, who you, you think is going like, to love this um, exhibition event, whatever it is, if only they know about it, you know, if they knew about it. What I find super inspiring about the word reach is that it, it feels like you're reaching out. And of course, that's a beautiful gesture. But it's not, about, it's not about the gesture, it's actually about the connection. It's about this. And re only reaching out is a one-way street. And I think why a lot of like reach projects or accessibility projects or inclusion projects don't work is because, because you are reaching out from the museum to your, your wanted audience while the actual thing that you need to learn is to understand each other, speak each other's language. And, and reaching out is, is the first step. But I think over the last couple of years, I think the last five years, the museum field in, the, in Europe made a tremendous step forward in that. And I think the time of reaching out is past. I think we should not only reach out, but connect. And that's why I'm, I'm so pro-inclusion, because inclusion means that you're not reaching out, but you stand next to each other and develop it together. And so what you're looking for is something that will attract the right type of person for the right type of content that you're creating. And, not, and, and it has to be understood that content needs to be designed for the audience in terms of it needs to deliver value to them, it needs to be pitched at the right level, it needs to deliver the kind of experience that they're expecting, and it has to deliver an effect or an impact for the organisation. So I kind of feel like the audience consideration is who is the audience and what is the effect that you're trying to have? Is it to increase knowledge? Is it to change behaviour? Is it to change a perception of the organisation? And kind of working from both the the impact that you want to have the effect that you're wanting to have on that person and the type of person that it is because everybody from our research everybody's entering that space with very different motivations and very different needs and very different expectations of what that experience is going to offer i think there's huge potential for interpretive content to have reach outside of the visitor experience space, especially in digital. So if you're creating video or audio content as part of 
your exhibition, say, that can appear either in its full form or in an edited down form online or on social media. If you're creating text, a written text that might appear uh, on the exhibition wall in a panel or little uh, labels that go near objects, of course that can be spliced up and repositioned, turned into anything from a, a blog post to a tweet. Cultural organisations are um, have, have been really pioneering in the use of new immersive technologies and creating exhibitions that sit alongside their kind of core collections. Um, they, they have a, a really kind of unique and powerful combination of, of venues, of audiences, of objects, of stories that can be um, great kind of starting material for these, these new types of experiences, which can, you know, deepen the engagement with, uh, for traditional audiences or in fact reach new audiences who would be attracted to this new way of telling stories. One of our biggest uh, studies was looking at about 50 different mobile experiences across multimedia, audio and mobile. And what we saw was that there were a vast array of usage rates and that was much more to do with the organization than it was with the device so what are your objectives what's your understanding of the audience how are you reaching them how are you raising awareness so a museum that's raising lots of awareness will get high reach and therefore be able to deliver high impact uh, a museum who has a sign that says audio guide and 12 audio guides underneath the desk will have no reach no matter what device they're on because they won't people won't use them as a museum we find it super important that all bodies are able to enter our museum galleries but also that are able to enter the collection and the stories that we are telling as 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 a museum and therefore, we developed an app that not only allows you to navigate in the museum, but also have a way in, a digital way into the stories behind all these different artworks. And that means that has like a digital component, but also um, a very physical one, because it allows you to understand how those physical objects work, where they are in, in, in the space and how to use them but it's not because it's not only the touch objects but also smell sound and of course the descriptions of the artworks themselves during the interpretation planning process i like to ask the question what reach could the interpretive content that we're creating potentially have because the short of it is that good interpretive content can have a life beyond a visitor experience. It could be used in a whole range of different ways. But if you leave the decision about whether to reposition or repurpose your content until you've finished making an exhibition, till it's all finally crafted and the ribbon has been cut on opening day, if then you start asking yourself, how might we reposition our content? You might not have created exactly the right product However, if you early on in the process think, you know, how can the content that we're creating potentially have a life outside of the exhibition space, then it's all the more likely that you've created something that can easily be uh, spliced up, edited, uh, shared, distributed in, in innovative ways that are beyond the visitor experience, rather than thinking, oh, we've been left with this interpretation, now how will we use it creatively? So the Coming Out exhibition uh, featured um, contemporary art by LGBTQ artists. Uh, it was a fantastic exhibition, but as always with uh, contemporary art, you have issues with over what you can share due to copyright restrictions. We decided to focus this, this exhibition very much on the LGBTQ community in Birmingham, you know, to, to hopefully make them feel part of it, as well as encouraging them to come in if they could. But that's what, you know, like I said, that's very much what our focus was on. So we began with a, kind of a launch day uh, where there was um, a drag artist down at uh, New Street Station. I think there's about five of them. And uh, they were all wearing costumes that were inspired by artworks in the, in, the collect in, in the exhibition, which is fantastic. One of them was Ginny Lemon, who's become quite famous since from for Drag Race. That was that was great. So many people stopped and were filming and taking photographs. So, you know, 
uh, and and then you know, like the kind of launch continue back over at the museum, which is a short walk from the station, uh, with the drag artist over there as well, and, and Joe Lysett, the comedian, um, actually sort of like launched the exhibition back at the the museum, and that kind of set the tone for it. I, I think really, you know, that this was a celebration. It was shareable. This was, you know, it was for. Um, well, it's for everybody, but you know that kind of focus on the on the LGBTQ community in Birmingham, I think, was really important. The museum robot is a digital door to the museum spaces. We wanted to open up the museum for people to, people that are physically not able to come to the museum, like people in hospitals or people that have a long term illness. But over the last couple of years, it turned out to be an actual digital door to new audiences. For instance, people from all over the world could visit our, 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 our gallery spaces. But also during lockdown, we were the only museum in the Netherlands that was still open. You had your, the museum for yourself and you can just drive the robot through because we had that tool already. So for us, it's really a tool to open up the museum for everyone. If we look at the type of content that's been produced over the last five years, we'll see lot, lots of it is a sort of digital version of analog experiences or traditional experiences. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's just making information or collections available online or, or filming live experiences. Um, I think audiences will become much more discerning about that very quickly. Um, the stuff that really connects and really reaches people now is a new type of, a new kind of breed of experiences which are which are kind of digitally native, which are created to use all of the functionality and possibilities of the platforms they're put out on. And, and that's a really kind of rich experience for, for audiences rather than the same type of experience, but experienced digitally. Content generally, if it's in the physical space, doesn't increase reach because people don't know what they're going to get until they get it. Reach is delivered by uh, awareness and understanding. Impact, as in effect, is delivered by content. I worked on a project with ATS recently at Cumbermere Abbey in Cheshire, where we were commissioned to create a film about the heritage of the site and the conservation that's gone on at the historic buildings there. Importantly, planned into that was making a, a short teaser that would go on social media. It's now being shared on Twitter, or on Instagram, on Facebook. It wasn't a case of us making a long film and then thinking, oh, this would make a really good teaser online. It was the intention from the start to create content that would have reach and to try and draw audiences towards the site that they then might go and watch uh, a longer piece of content. It's going to be a challenge in, in the coming years for uh, new types of technology experience in institutions. Often, previously, these have been the first time people have done these types of things, AR, VR. Um, and there's an inherent wow. But in the coming years, audiences are going to become much more discerning about those experiences. They will start to be able to kind of um, uh, judge them and rank them and compare them like more traditional media forms. So we've really got to focus on exactly what we want the type of immersion to be. Is it is it an action? Do we want people to do something because of it? Is it a much more sensory or emotional one? Do we want them to kind of uh, ha have some kind of change experience through this? I'm not sure that there is, but great shareable content is always going to go a long way. Yes, there is. And it's you've got to keep your audiences in mind as you're creating content. There is a magic formula, but it's not a simple formula. It's about combining uh, audience, platform, interaction, all of these types of things to create the type of content that the audience needs and not just what the organisation wants. <laughs> it should be. Honestly, no, there's no magic formula. Sorry. So it's been a real pleasure supporting Culture Geek for another year. Thanks to everybody who took part in our video and we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully 2022 will be more of a physical conference. It'll be great to catch up with all of you and uh, hopefully see you then. Focused on creating fantastic visitor experiences, working with ATS is all about collaboration. You know your audiences and your organisation better than anyone. And we know how to tell great stories and deliver them with the most impact be that on site or online. You will work with a team brimming with creativity and originality 
We will spend time with you to explore a whole range of creative approaches and technologies, from award-winning multimedia and audio tours, to films, apps, virtual tours and websites. We'll design and create what best works for you and your audiences. We do a lot more besides, so please do get in touch. It'll be great to hear from you. And in the meantime, enjoy the rest of the conference and we'll see you next year.